I am the master of my emotions. Issues relating to teaching the language of emotions to individuals with autism. My name is Andy Bondi. This talk will review some of the complex issues associated with teaching children with autism to express their emotions and to respond to the emotions of others. We will take a look at some suggestions by B.F. Skinner and see if they can help us design effective lessons. We also will look at some traditional approaches to this issue from within behavioral orientations as well as some that are non-behavioral in theory. We will end up considering some practical issues that may help us improve our lessons dealing with emotions. Several years ago, a mother came to school and announced that her son had mastered emotions. We weren't sure what she meant, so we asked her to explain. She looked at her son and said, show me happy. He contorted his face into something resembling a grimace or extreme smile. She then said, show me angry. He flexed both his arms in front of him. Think Arnold showing off his muscles and frowned. His mother turned to us and said with pride, see? Now, this mom had done exactly what she had been taught to do. But had her son truly learned anything about emotions? I think not. So, what's the problem? Many of us talk about how difficult it is for those with autism to express their emotions and feelings. They have trouble describing what they are currently thinking and may have difficulty in explaining why they are doing what they are doing. They appear to have great limitations in using body language and other subtle signs of emotional display, from facial actions to involvement of the whole body. And they also sometimes simply do not respond to the body language of other people or to subtle changes in tone of voice or intonational patterns. Typically developing children begin to rapidly acquire a broad range of emotional indicators, and it happens so quickly and naturally that parents often are not even aware of teaching any lessons about emotional expression. Some of the behaviors are relatively simple and direct, things such as, my finger hurts, I have a boo-boo, this tastes yucky, to more complex cases such as, I'm very happy today, I really don't like the taste of this. I'm frightened of the dark. Finally, we acquire skills that are far more complex and subtle. Statements such as, I love you for who you are. I'm feeling as if I'm drowning under your scrutiny. What all these statements have in common is that they all refer to things happening inside our skin. They are within us. No one else has any access to them. We have no direct way of knowing what anyone else is feeling or thinking. Even when someone says, I'm hungry, we can only assert that she said, I'm hungry. We have no direct way of observing or experiencing her hunger. Another term for describing these sources of the language of emotion is that they are private events. How good are we at teaching the language of emotions? Many of us use pictures of facial expressions as a way to teach the name of many emotions. But is there general agreement about these expressions? Here are a series of line drawings of facial expressions. Look at each face and note to yourself what emotion you think is represented. Did you agree with all of them? This little exercise demonstrates that there is a great deal of disagreement amongst typical adults. If this is the case, imagine how difficult it is for those who have difficulty acquiring language to learn the real names of that face when so many people disagree with each other. Skinner wrote an exceptionally important book in 1957 called Verbal Behavior. In this book, he used all the principles of learning he had studied and considered if they could be used to analyze language. This book is unusual for Skinner 
in that there are no data or studies reported. There is no how-to section. It is simply an analysis of the behavioral control of the units of language. Each language unit, or verbal operant, is defined by its functional relationship to antecedent and consequence conditions, the ABC contingency we often refer to. If you are not familiar with Skinner's analysis, you may first want to watch our verbal behavior webcast. Each unit has a special name, man, tact, interverbal, etc., to help distinguish it from other units. A man specifies its own reinforcer. It is a request or command. I want the ball leads someone to give us the ball. A tact is influenced by aspects of the environment and results in social reinforcement. I see the ball leads to someone agreeing, yes, it is a ball, but not necessarily to getting the ball. Introverbals are influenced by what others say, and eventually we do learn to talk to ourselves. Echoics also are influenced by what others say, but here the form of what I say is similar to the form of what you say. You say ball, and I say ball. We'll come back to the autoclitic later in this talk. For Skinner, verbal behavior does not mean vocal behavior. Consider it more similar to the term language. Here is a direct quote from Skinner in which he makes it clear that the form of a response does not help us identify the function of the response. A child can say cookie, but sometimes it can be a man, leading to getting a cookie. Sometimes it is attacked, leading to someone saying, yes, I also see that cookie, while at other times it can be an introverbal, as when we answer, name something we eat, or it can be an echoic, as in we say cookie after hearing someone else say the word. This talk in the language of emotions can be equally helpful for those who speak, use PECs, use speech generating devices, or use sign language. Let's watch a short video of young Leo, who is 14 months old. We can see that Leo has acquired some speech 
but even more verbal behavior. That is, typically developing children first acquire verbal behavior and then acquire speech. Note that he uses his voice as well as other actions, gestures and eye gaze, to influence those around him. So, what did Skinner have to say about the language of emotions? First, remember that there is no how-to section, no manual or description of specific lessons within the book. But he does use many examples that are extremely helpful. In the chapter on the tact, he has a section on generating verbal behavior to private stimuli, stimuli that only the speaker has access to. He writes in a straightforward manner that members of the community can teach a tact to private events in part because there is a common public accompaniment. We see a child get hit, for example, or fall. Furthermore, we see some collateral response. For example, we see a child crying or wincing. These are behaviors that can be observed by everyone around the child and are not private. Next, Skinner notes that the child often hears someone else talking about what's happening. That is, dad may say, wow, I bet your arm hurts, or may indirectly comment to mom, he fell and hurt his arm. After hearing this, the child may repeat or echo what was said, as in, yes, it hurts. At that point, other principles of learning may influence what happens next. For example, we may see generalization occur after the child falls on his leg and says, my leg hurts. Does this description match up with your own experiences? Consider this example. You are inside the kitchen watching your very young grandson running around the yard while wearing shorts. Suddenly, you see him fall. When he stands, he is bleeding from his knee and he is crying. What do we do? Of course, we run outside, pick him up and say in a soothing manner, Oh, you poor baby, you hurt your knee. Ouch! You are also likely to say, How do you feel? And he replies, My knee hurts. He calms down and starts to play again. You go inside the house. Soon, he runs in the house and says, I hurt my arm. His falling and bleeding were both public accompaniments, and his crying was a collateral response. He said, my knee hurts only after you told him how he felt. And then later, he generalized the use of hurt to other situations. This equally applies to how we learn to comment about pleasant emotions. For example, you watch your grandson at his two-year birthday party. Up until now, he has never been given ice cream. But today, you give him his first ice cream cone. What does he do? Of course, he eats it as quickly as he can, making a mess of himself, but smiling and giggling the whole time. What do we say? Oh, you like that ice cream. That tastes really good. And he says, yes, I really like this. Later, while eating his first taste of chocolate cake, he comments, this cake tastes good. How did we know what he was feeling? We saw him with the ice cream, a public accompaniment, and he was eating quickly and smiling, collateral responses, and later he generalized to new situations. So, what happens with children with autism? When they fall, do they not bleed? When a child with autism is given his first ice cream cone, what does he do? Of course, he'll eat it as quickly as possible and make a mess of things while doing that. But what may be missing from these situations? At times, we may not see particular facial expressions. The child with autism who falls or is even bleeding may not be crying. The child eating that ice cream cone may not be smiling. And think about what we often fail to do when we do not see these facial expressions. Unfortunately, 
many of us do not tell the child what he or she is feeling. I once observed a young girl put her hand on top of a hot stove. She immediately pulled her hand away and never touched the stove again. But if you focused on her face, you may not have observed any significant change. Did it hurt her? Of course. How do we know? Because she pulled her hand away and never touched the stove again. And a child with autism will eat that first ice cream cone just as quickly as anyone, but may not be smiling. Did he like the ice cream? Of course. How do we know? Because he eats it as quickly as possible. But again, we may not tell that child what in fact he or she is feeling. There are two personal observations I'd like to add to this discussion. They are not evidence-based in that I know of no research that supports these claims, but I'm confident that they will be consistent with your own observations and experiences in the world. First, children first learn to tact public events before they learn to tact private events. That is, all children first learn to comment about things around them. That's a chair. That's a bird. He's Uncle Sam. Before they begin to comment on private events, such as my headaches, or I'm very happy. This sequence would be expected to be true for children with autism and with anyone using modalities such as PECs. Second, if we do not tell a child what he or she is feeling, then there is no opportunity for them to learn to talk about their emotions. That is, we only learn to talk about our emotions after someone else has told us what we are feeling. We tell children what they are feeling, and then they can tell us, engaging in the echoic, about what they are feeling. Unfortunately, I believe that we often rely too much on facial expressions to judge whether feelings are present and undervalue other public or collateral changes. Children with autism feel pain and pleasure as we all do. Their behavior indicates that. When they refuse to touch something or pull away from something, that is fear, the emotion we identify in association with punishing stimuli. When they quickly approach and become involved with something, food, an object, or an event, they are enjoying or liking that thing. That is the feeling we associate with reinforcing events. Because a child does not engage in a facial change or does not talk about something does not mean that they don't have feelings or that they feel things in a different manner than we do. Let's shift gears for a moment. How has our field dealt with teaching children about their emotions? How did the mom I mentioned earlier come to think she was teaching her son to express his emotions? As with many other aspects of our field, we need to look at the work of Ivar Lovas because he was a true leader in the field. In a recent book, he describes some of the reasoning connected with how he developed particular lessons. It is informative to read these directly. Children were taught to hug, but many times the embraces seemed more like the children were merely going through the emotions without real feelings. We referred to these hugs as operant hugs. Now, operant hugs implies that the children were only hugging to gain some reinforcer, perhaps an M&M, not as a reflection of some private event. At the same time, it became apparent that it was impossible to teach the children to laugh or cry when it was appropriate to express such feelings. Now, this is a remarkably strong statement. In essence, he was stating that they had not taught these children to laugh or cry when appropriate and concluded that because they couldn't do it, no one else could do it either. Thus, it was impossible. Finally, their genuine appearance most likely reflects that these emotions are inborn or reflexive expressions common to all human beings. 
So, rather than operants governed by their consequences, Lavasse now appears to assert that the expression of emotions is reflexive and thus not readily influenced by reinforcement. So, what did Lavasse do, given the difficulty encountered by trying to teach lessons about emotions directly? As you can read on this slide, he decided to focus first on teaching emotions in others before attempting to teach about things going on inside the child. The first lessons are associated with identifying outside expressions of emotions, then how these correspond to internal or private states, and finally, how to talk about such feelings. Formally, these lessons begin by putting a picture of someone displaying an emotional expression that is smiling, frowning, yelling, etc., and teaching the child to point to the person who is smiling. This lesson is the receptive idea of emotion in 2D format that is so commonly used. Next, the stimulus materials become in vivo. That is, the lesson is now live. Two people in the room are displaying two different emotions, and someone says to the child, point to the person who is sad. Next, the lesson becomes expressive labeling. How does he feel? Happy. How does she feel? Upset. First with pictures, then with real-life people. More advanced lessons follow that address the connection between facial expressions, smiling, and the inferred feelings, happy. These are followed by noting the cause of the feeling. He is upset because someone took his toy. And finally, the focus shifts to the child. How do you feel? Happy. Why? Because I'm eating ice cream. It should be noted that you can look through many other examples of behaviorally oriented materials and manuals on teaching, and all will follow this basic course of training. Many protocols recommend that we begin with receptive identification of pictures of emotions and then go to expressive lessons and begin with pictures before introducing real people. And only at the end, move to the feelings of the child. There are many programs that focus on this issue that do not follow a behavioral orientation. For example, many claim that this issue of emotions is related to the problem that children with autism have in mind reading, knowing and acting in accordance with other people having minds. However, the actual sequence of training is remarkably similar to what we just described. They begin with lessons such as point to happy, using pictures, and then moving to pointing to people in the room. They introduce action sequences and teach the child to anticipate the feeling of others. How will he feel before trying to teach the child to respond to his or her own emotions? There is one approach, the Hannon approach developed in Canada, which has an interesting take on things. Much of what they do supports the use of systems such as PECs, although they refer to cue cards and may involve pointing rather than exchanging the pictures. Nonetheless, they state directly, the best time to identify emotions with a cue card is when your child is experiencing them. Who does this most sound like? Their example clearly points out that mom gets her son to comment about his feelings, happy, while he is having that feeling, while he is happy. So, a non-behavioral approach recommends something that best fits Skinner's analysis. Let's review why this area of teaching is so problematic with children with autism. Is it because they do not have feelings? No. Surely they do. Is it because they have no language? Well, even those with rather complex language continue to have difficulty in this area. In terms of teaching strategies, it is clearly easier to create teaching materials and lessons by collecting pictures of emotions 
or directing other people to display particular emotions rather than arranging for the child to have certain feelings at certain times. Are there other factors that make this lesson difficult? In the book Verbal Behavior, Skinner never talks about specific disabilities or why they may occur. He never speaks directly about autism. However, he does write about social reinforcement in a way that makes it clear that he views this as central to the development of being conscious. It is only through the gradual growth of a verbal community that the individual becomes conscious. That is, if we do not interact with others and respond to social reinforcement, we literally do not learn who we are. The other verbal operant that we noted earlier is the autoclitic, a strange sounding word indeed. Skinner created this word from two Greek roots, auto meaning self and clitic meaning leaning. Thus, autoclitics are words that lean upon words. What does this mean? Essentially, autoclitics are not so much controlled by things in the world around us, but rather by things within us that govern our own verbal behavior. They indicate either a property of the speaker's behavior or the circumstances responsible for that property. When I ask for a big red cookie, both big and red are related to the cookie. They are not autoclitics, but are tax controlled by the properties of the cookie itself. But consider the sentence, I really want a cookie. What is controlling the use of the word really? It is not related to the cookie. Whether you said, I want a cookie, or I really want a cookie, the same cookie would show up. So what does change? It is something rather subtle. The person hearing me say, I really want a cookie, might get me that cookie a little more quickly. Skinner is well aware that non-vocal behaviors can influence the meaning of our communication. How we say things can change the meaning of what is said. My tone of voice can completely reverse the conventional meaning of a word or phrase. If I were to say, oh sure we're going outside, it's raining, my tone of voice would assure that you would know that we are not going outside. But many children with autism or Asperger's syndrome would line up at the door because they heard me say, we're going outside. They would miss the autoclitic effect of my tone of voice. The same is true for what we call body language. Furthermore, Skinner points out that many aspects of our writing have an autoclitic effect, including punctuation marks. Consider the use of emoticons in writing, little images that convey great meaning without words. The exceptional writer does not simply tell a narrative story. They use many autoclitics to get the reader to feel the pain of the character involved. Finally, think of all the texting strategies that our teenagers are using that distance them for us more and more each day. Many involve novel autoclitics. Let's watch another video of Leo, now many months later, when his language has continued to grow, as have his autoclitics. Notice that he first asks, who's in here, when unwrapping a birthday present. That is an example of a man for information. But then he says, yes, it's really like a cow. This is not simply a tact. It is a cow. He is using really like to indicate to others 
something about himself and not just the toy. Thus, we see that autoclitic use begins very early for typically developing children. Is there a relationship between the development of the autoclitic and areas of concern in autism? Well, Skinner wrote that the contingencies which generate a response to one's own verbal responses are unlikely in the absence of social reinforcement. Do we know of a population that appear to be relatively insensitive to social reinforcement? By definition, that is the central characteristic of children with autism. So, essentially, Skinner is making a prediction that if a person did not receive or respond well to social reinforcement, then the development of responses to one's own responses, or the autoclitic, would be difficult. Thus, while Skinner does not write directly about autism, he helps us understand a major aspect of the condition. Several years ago, Laurie Frost and I looked at a language sample from a group of children with autism matched in language performance on a standardized test with a group of children with developmental delay. In the fashion of doing a discourse analysis, we recorded an hour's worth of conversation and then counted examples of autoclitics used. In Skinner's chapter on the autoclitic, he identified many different types of autoclitics by function. For example, assertion as in yes and no, strength as in really or some, and others. What we found was that children with autism use far fewer types of autoclitics than those children with developmental delay. Remember, their overall language measures were equivalent. We also did a quick comparison for the total number of autoclitics used per utterance for these same groups and added a third group, typically developing young children. What we found was that typical children used some type of autoclitic in over half of all their utterances, while those with developmental delay use these in somewhat under 20% of their utterances. However, those with autism only involved an autoclitic in roughly 5%, one in 20 sentences. In short, the language of typically developing children is rich with autoclitic qualifiers, and children with developmental delay, but not autism, also use them to a fair extent. But those with autism rarely use autoclitics to help listeners better understand them. So the question becomes, what can we do with this analysis? Can we create more effective lessons involving the emotions of these children? Can we take advantage of naturally occurring opportunities, as do most parents? Or do we need to act more as a teacher does, create the opportunity for a lesson by creating the feelings themselves? And finally, we will have to consider how to create strong feelings in an ethically sound fashion. One strategy involves what is often called capturing the moment. We see something unfolding. A child is engrossed in a toy, or a child is pushing away an offered item of food, and take advantage of the opportunity. We can label what the child is feeling and try to have the child play back or echo what was said. Of course, if we are working with a child who signs, we will have to make the appropriate sign. Or for those using PECs, we will have to use appropriate pictures. If you know your child must go to the doctor's office for an allergy shot every week, you know exactly when your child's arm will hurt. And that is the time to teach a lesson about pain. However, simply waiting for the right opportunity can waste a great deal of time. A good teacher arranges things so that the lesson is soon available. To do this, you must know the child, what makes them happy, or scared, or nervous, or proud. The best strategy is to create the feeling. Arrange for something to happen 
that will lead your student to feel proud of her accomplishment. At that very moment, tell her what she is feeling, and then get her to tell you what she is feeling. It is not good enough to simply say at a random time, I'm proud of myself, and have your child repeat that. That teaches imitation, not the expression of feelings. In order to teach a good lesson, we must be aware of one other factor. Words have meaning only in contrast to other words. For example, if I were trying to teach a child the word blue, if everything is blue, he says blue all the time, then nothing is blue. Blue would have no meaning. Only when a girl says blue under one circumstance, and before blue things, and says red in different circumstances, before red things, would we say meaning or a discrimination is made. So it is with the language of emotion. Happy has no meaning unless I also note I'm sad at times. We are not happy all the time. Thus, for each emotional word you try to teach, you must have something that can contrast with that feeling. Happy versus sad, angry versus calm, etc. But notice that finding the proper contrast may not be simple. For example, anxious is often used when anticipating something bad is about to happen. So what is the word for when I anticipate that something good is about to happen? Right, it's not going to be easy. You'll have many interesting discussions here. Don't worry about the perfect word, just one that is used consistently in contrast to your other word. Furthermore, you will have to carefully consider how you will create situations that will make your student feel angry, sad, in pain, etc. You should never make these decisions alone. Always involve the full team and the family. You will need to discuss the ethical considerations associated with generating those strong feelings. If you want to learn more about how to design these types of lessons, then come to a full-day workshop on this topic and practice creating such lessons. Let's consider creating a real lesson. Many people talk about feeling anxious and realize that their children or students often seem to be experiencing anxiety. First, let's think about how we should define anxiety. It will help to think about what happens to you that leads you to feeling anxious. When something bad happens, I may report that I am hurt, in pain, or feeling sad. However, anxiety is a little different than feeling immediate pain. If I know I am about to get an injection, the feeling prior to the injection is anxiety. As we noted, to teach one feeling, you must teach a feeling that is in sharp contrast to it. So, to teach about anxiety, you also need to teach about something that may be the opposite. What would this be? The opposite of anxiety is anticipation of something good that is about to happen. You may quickly realize that one problem is there is no good word in English that perfectly matches this feeling. We use anticipation regarding both good and bad things. So your team will have to agree upon what word you want to use. The next lesson will probably be a little more difficult, how to teach autoclitics. Consider a simple question. Have you ever taught a child with autism to effectively use the word really? I've asked this question to thousands of people around the world and have very rarely heard a positive reply. Why is it so hard to teach? Recall that autoclitics are controlled by aspects of the person engaging in verbal behavior, not by changes in the world around us. Thus, 
If you are to teach the proper use of an autoclinic, you must manipulate conditions within the learner. Not an easy thing to do. For example, when do we say the word really? Under normal circumstances, I might simply say, I'm thirsty. But after running around and sweating a great deal, or after eating a very salty food, I'm more likely to say, I'm really thirsty. Therefore, you'd have to do things to vary the motivation for water in your student, and then teach the appropriate use of words. Not the use of really in every sentence, but only in some sentences. To learn the skill, the learner will need to experience different outcomes associated with the use of different words. Furthermore, it will be important in teaching both advanced lessons about emotions as well as using and responding to autoclinics to involve age-appropriate peers. We do not want our children to sound like short adults. They should say what other children in our community say. Again, if you'd like to learn more about how to create such lessons, you'll need to come to a full-day training on this fascinating topic. This talk has given you a brief outline of some of the issues associated with teaching children and adults to use the language of emotions and to respond to its use by others. The work of Skinner provides a wonderful analysis of how such language units develop and suggest how to create effective lessons. It can also help us look at traditional lessons and see whether they are actually teaching what is intended. When a child points to a picture of someone smiling, he is not learning to communicate about his private events. He is behaviorally far from that. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, Pyramid Educational Consultants offers a full-day workshop on the language of emotion, as well as on analyzing and fine-tuning communication, which offers a full day's introduction to Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior. Furthermore, our consultants will be happy to help you create more effective lessons involving the language of emotions.